Purple Stars podcast. I'm Sarah, your host, and we have another amazing guest for you on the show today. She's a snowboarding legend. She has won two Olympic gold medals, 31 World Cup gold medals, and she has won six world championships. She's also a published author, but what sets our guest apart is not just her extraordinary list of accomplishment, but her humility and grounded nature. Please welcome Lindsay Chakabalis. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for ha having us. We know you have been traveling so much. You just came back from Europe, right? I was in Europe over the holidays, and then I was briefly home in California. I was just getting caught up on life there, and now I have some work, and I'm heading back to Stratton Mountain today after this interview. So I figured, you know, I'd see my parents and catch up with them and then drive up north and then I'll be heading to Europe again uh, to start up the World Cup race season for 2024. That's exciting. Where will be the first World Cup? Um, our season started in uh, early December. We had uh, the France World Cup in Les Deux Alps and then We had a Trevenia in Italy, but to start off with January, we're actually heading to St. Moritz, which is actually a new location. We've never mm. raced there before. So it's very rare that I get a new stop on tour. So this is exciting to check out a new spot and learn a new mountain and experience a, a different little village. It's always so special to, you know, find these little gems along the way. Have you already been in San Moritz the last time you went to Europe to prep there? Or is it like a prep just short time whenever you get back there? Some, uh, some teams will go and check out locations. You see that more building up towards an Olympics or world championships because they'll start maybe testing boards and wax at that location. However, this is just a world cup, um, And the following year, I believe they will be having a world championships there. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of the, the dry run for the host mountain to be, you know, getting a great understanding of how a, a snowboard cross event will operate there, what it looks like, what they need to improve on. And it also gives the athletes a chance to, to really get a, a feel for the land as well. You just mentioned to get a feel for the land. How does that work in your sport? Do you um, also visualize a lot? Do you like feel, feel it out? Do you like, you know, like skiers go like step by step and then you look up or how, how does that work in snowboarding? It's so second nature to me now, but I do actively take myself through a course after I've inspected it, after I've trained on it a couple of runs because we're allowed a few training runs before we get into time trials and then into heats. Um, as I was younger, you know, I had to spend more time on that because I wasn't as uh, adverse to understanding how, um, how those little key factors Uh, would really play a big role. So just to get the practice, I'd have to concentrate on it more, but it's a little more natural to me now. Um, but it's still a very good practice and it's still wonderful to run in your mind, different scenarios, different lines, because you never know what you're presented on that day. In time trials, you're on the course by yourself. So you have the pick of the litter when it comes to what lines you want to take. When you're negotiating three other riders on the course, you have to have a plan A, B, C, D, you know, and, and all in between all from top to bottom. So it, it's constantly changing. It used to be very fatiguing when I was younger to think about, well, if I'm in second position at this first turn, mm -hmm. but then I make a pass, what my position and strategy would be then. But if I'm in third in that turn, what what I do at the next turn or this straight away. So it was just this endless combination And it and it it was mentally fatiguing and exhausting after every race. I wasn't physically drained. I was more mentally drained. So over the years after developing those skills, it does not drain me as much. What do you think has helped you with all the strategies 
to loosen the grip when it's necessary, because I think with any kind of performance, as much as we prep, there is a point where it's important to lose center grip to get into our flow. I wonder between all the plan A, B, C, D, like how, what helped you to do that? I think it also changed throughout the years when I was younger, just gaining more experience in the next race, knowing you have the next race and the next race after that was always a comforting feeling because I always did put a lot of pressure on myself to win. And now being more seasoned, I'm more forgiving towards myself because some days my body's just not feeling it. There's, there's days that I'm like, oh, I didn't have to take any ibuprofen. My knee feels great. My thumb feels great. My elbow feels great. My lower back feels great. <laughs> and, and, you know, you just go down the laundry list of injuries and, you know, there's just some days that you're just on, you know, you had great sleep, you, you're happy with uh, your nutrition and all these patterns, all of these things play in a, such a big role and maybe, you know, for one week, you have, you know, funky sleep or you're not getting the nutrition you need and that won't affect you all that much. But if that pattern continues and you're traveling and you're, and you're having challenges, you know, supplementing those uh, things that could really make a difference in your performance, that's maybe when things start to slip. So understanding how your, you know, external factors can also play and it's not just always about you. Sometimes it's out of your control. Sometimes you can't control, you know, what the the World Cup is serving. You can't control, you know, if flights are delayed or things mm -hmm. like that. So it's over the years you kind of just learn to roll with the punches and not get so worked up. So therefore you're conserving as much energy when it comes race time. So there's just there's no there's no blueprint. It's it's always this back and forth. It's jumbling. It's, it's juggling all of these different factors, just like border cross. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're clearly such an, an experienced athlete. And I think that's not just reflected in your medals, but in your resilience, the way you are very reflected when it comes to the factors that impact your performance, how to, you know, like also forgive yourself as you said, how to mentally navigate all the pressures. I wonder when looking back, was there a, or is there one particular lesson that you that sticks out to you when it comes to your journey and something where you said, wow, snowboarding really taught me that, both for on and off the slope? Well, obviously the most obvious one would be 2006 Olympics, but I feel snowboarding as a whole, what that taught me was discipline. There's so mm -hmm. many people that ask me, how do you stay motivated to go to the gym all the time? Or how do you stay motivated to keep racing and to keep going for these goals? And I tell them it's not a motivation. It's a discipline. I've been <laughs> training myself to get up train to have some sort of task throughout the day that I need to accomplish. I have monthly goals, you know, quarterly goals, yearly goals, long-term goals, and knowing that those roads to those goals can shift and have to move and adjust. That's normal and that's healthy. However, you still have some sort of trajectory that you are shooting for and discipline, learning that very, very early at Stratton Mountain School and being accountable for your actions was probably the biggest takeaway from snowboard cross in general. Learning to go to the gym, understanding what it means to be a professional athlete as I was training to be a professional athlete. I love what you said. It is discipline and it's not motivation. I think that's something a lot of people confuse and mix up yes. with because they see on Instagram, if now I'm touching point on our social media is like, oh, this person gets up at five o'clock and does this and that and travels and they all see like the healthy choices they make, but they also don't know. It's not because they're always motivated and like, yeah, it's five o'clock. I'm going to the gym. It's actually a lot of days. It's like, ooh, 
I would much rather lie in, but this is my job. This is my path. That's what I need to show up for myself, for my team, for my coaches. And I think what another thing is where people also sometimes get confused is when it comes to passion. So my mother tongue is German and I love the word passion in German because it involves, includes the word suffering. <laughs> and I think that is actually quite correct because when we love something and when we are passionate about something, it's not like it's portrayed on social media. Oh, it's great. I always love it. And I have my vision board and my things. No, it, it includes the willingness to suffer. It inc includes the willingness to push through when you suffer and also knowing it's part of the path. And I think if more people would understand that mm -hmm. what you just said with motivation and discipline and passion and suffering, they would perform much better both in their personal and their professional life because they wouldn't have this picture where they romanticize life and actually see things as reality and know it's normal that on the fifth day their body gets tired or that they're not always motivated because a lot of people start then questioning their prof and they're like, oh, mm -hmm. if I'm not that motivated, is this maybe not meant for me? Especially nowadays with social media, I think that's happening even more. I, I think you could not have been more perfect in that description. And I love bringing your heritage involved in that because like you said, people just see the perfect side of social media and you don't always see the before and afters or the struggle or the hard times in between and that your, that your job can have these ups and downs. So if they're not seeing that and they experience these downs, then it's very hard to continue that discipline and to fuel, to help fuel that motivation to, you know, keep this positive cycle going. So yeah, I, I love that. I love how he said that. I remember, so I was a competitive golf player at high school and back then there was no, not really social media. So we would watch the great players on TV, you know, and there was also like hardly ever replay. So we would have to stay up late if they were pl like playing in the U S and I will never forget the first time I was at a life event, walking with them and watching them. And one of the players didn't have a good shot. And I was like, wow, they also have bad shots. It really hit me as a teenager because on TV, you only see the good shots. You know, like they yeah. always cut it. You only the see reel. the highlight reel. Exactly. You see the yeah. ones winning, but it, and it made me like, I could feel it relief. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was young, of course. So also, but I will always remember when this guy, who ended up also being the number one in the world after a few years had this bad shot. I'm like, okay, he does the same. It's fine. <laughs> so I think it's good to have a picture of reality. And this being said, I would love to talk about your book because I think yes. the book is very raw. It's very real. And the title actually already says everything. Mm -hmm. Unforgiving lessons from the fall. Would you like to share whatever you want to share about the fall? And then I would love to really dive into the forgiving part. So I was very nervous to write this book because like you said, it, it tells everything. It tells my emotional state and my physical state and just things that athletes struggle with that, you know, normal individuals that aren't in that space might not understand or might not even be aware of. So you know, there's that vulnerability to decide I'm going to write, you know, a memoir that really, you know, shares so many details. But after thinking about it for a long time, I decided, well, let's, let's take the Instagram, like social media, perfect life out of it and share everything because that is important. And that can relate to people that have setbacks, that have had failures and to not be giving up on themselves and to figure out ways to push through and to keep the discipline and the motivation. So that was, that was a main reason I, I wanted to share my experience, but then also to bring light to how challenging being a professional athlete can be and what I was 
what the pressures of success I was putting on for myself, especially after Torino. And so Torino was my first Olympics. I was the favorite to win. So all the media around going into 2004, 2005, it was just, it was setting me up to be this golden girl, a little girl next door and America's little sweetheart. And it was a lot to live up to. And, you know, not fully understanding why in that moment it was a good idea to reach down and grab my board it was still unknown. And to, to this day, you know, been going through therapy and try to understand what was happening in my adolescent mind at that time. And all we could really come to it was that it was just an act of an immature mind, an impulsive excitement just that just came out at the, the wrong time. And I had to live with that. And that was, you know, something that I had to understand that happened. I had to figure out how to move on from it because in some ways I see myself growing and moving on from that scenario, but then I'd hit these setbacks and it wasn't really until I started working with my mental coach years down the road that I still saw these missing pieces to my full self and my true potential to help me be in the best mental and physical condition to perform at my very best. And this wasn't something that really people talked about, you know, 16 years ago with mental health and mental mm. awareness going into it being athletes. It was just, it was just said, Oh, this is just a, a fierce competitor. They're a strong competitor. Not that they're a well-rounded individual that is an excellent ath like athlete as well as very strong in the mental space. And I love that that is now being introduced to younger athletes and having them do these, uh, you know, workshops with their coaches or one-on-one -on -one to understand, you know, how to build mental strengths around a certain skill set. Um, so bringing my story to life had its challenging moments, but I did feel it was important. And I'd also think it would continue to help me grow to have to share that moment again, because that was a really hard moment to live and then live through, but then come back and then share the full, full story <laughs> to, to everyone again, to hopefully inspire and to give hope to anyone that's struggling with anything in their life, really, because it's all, it's all relatable. Do you feel that writing the book and publishing was a big part on your healing journey when it came to it, particularly forgiving yourself and also the media? I think it was, I think it was the last step to, to healing because still every now and then, no matter how many times I'd worked with my you know, mental skills coach and my, you know, my, my coaches with snowboarding, you know, anytime that was brought up in the media or I was asked that question, I still had that like little jerk reaction and now I don't have the reaction. So it's, it's a part of the story, but it's not the full story and it's not the full me. It was a moment. I take it as a, a stride of where I had to grow from and You know, that's, I think that was important because I, I tortured myself m more even than the media did. It was just never helpful when the media came back around and kept just, you know, chipping away at me and, and I was having to spend so much extra energy and effort to hold myself together while I was still trying to compete on those stages every four years. It was just, it was not helping me put together this winning combination. So knowing that that was coming in Beijing, I opted not to do certain media tours mm -hmm. leading up to it. I, I opted to honor myself, take care of myself to, to give myself what I needed instead of kind of just being 
you know, dragged around and just being put in front of this group of people or that group of people. And I promised myself I wanted to enjoy this Olympic experience and that it was going to be about me and my experience more and enjoying the whole journey and process going through athlete processing and getting all the clothes and, and getting to Mm -hmm. pose for pictures with your teammates and we're all in the matching. It's such a different dynamic because we're an individual sport. Yes. But we function and we move and train and travel as a team. So I was trying to really embrace all of those things that every time every Olympic cycle would come around, I wouldn't be able to pull myself into because I had just had so much extra noise that was just not allowing me to really enjoy that. And so it became really stressful knowing that I was going to the Olympics, not to compete, but knowing that I was going to be exposed and I knew I was going to be experiencing those feelings again. So working with my mental coach, she was like, well, this is going to be easy because we know what you're going to be up against. So we know your emotional reactions to certain questions to certain interactions with people or media. Therefore we can start working with this. And it was extremely helpful. I got goosebumps when you explained the entire (laughs) journey, especially, especially when you said it helped you to live the journey in the way that serves you rather than the media. Yes. And I even see that that fall, for whatever reason, but prepped you for the next two gold medals. And that you could... It's a act- long prep time, but... Yeah. <laughs> but, it does, but it's gold medals at Olympic Games, and also they're only every four years. <laughs> so it's naturally a, a longer prep. But yeah. it's... I find it... I, I think it's, it's such a great um, proof that in every fall, literally there are gifts that help us to rise afterwards even higher. Mm -hmm. And, but what makes it such a great story and great journey is not the two gold medals, but you having the courage to look within, to face your fears, to also, as you said, because 2006, 2007, having a mental skill coach wasn't that, you know, it's like the mental health. I remember when I had my first mental coach, it was also around that time and people would say, are you okay? Because it was such a new thing. People would think something is mentally wrong with you if you would mm-hmm. work on your mental game. It was normal to do the physical part and have a physio mm-hmm. and do the personal training, but it wasn't as much as it's now to incorporate everything holistically to really yeah. be happy and healthy and successful. So I, I find it very inspiring that you were so many steps ahead of time and also that you learned to be less dependent on the media mm. and actually take again and be in the driver's seat rather than the passenger seat. And I think that also came with maturity and mm. learning to say, no, that's not a part of my journey today because so many people can take advantage of that. And they'd be like, oh, well, you're in this space. It makes sense for you to be doing, you know, as much media as you can and get your story out there. And I told myself going up in the first couple, the the weeks going into Beijing, I said, you know, my story's out there. I, it, I don't need to harp on this. I need to take that extra time to make sure my equipment is ready and we're doing board testing and I'm getting enough sleep and figuring out the nutrition. I mean, we're also dealing with COVID and trying to stay as healthy as possible. There were so many other factors that were in play. It just seemed ridiculous to try to, you know, jump through another hoop. So I was honoring myself and I was really happy that I was recognizing that. And I gave myself that opportunity to take care of myself first. You have already mentioned uh, your professional team. I wonder what role has your family played on that journey of healing, especially? My family has always been very supportive. My brother got me into the sport from a very young age. We were always the weekend warriors going up to Stratton. We were skiing 
And my brother just tried snowboarding one day and I was naturally, I'm five years younger and everything that my brother does, it was amazing. And I had to be a part of it. And so I had to quickly learn how to be doing what my brother was doing. Otherwise I'd be left behind. You know, my brother wasn't exactly going to wait for me. He was going to ride and have fun with his friends. So if I couldn't keep up, that was the, that was the driving factor. I needed to keep up. Otherwise I needed to, you know, ski with my parents or other friends, but I so desperately wanted to win my brother's approval and prove to him that I could keep up and I, I could, he could have just as much fun with me. And so that was a, a big drive there. And <laughs> I just always, I, I don't know why I put so much pressure on myself to always keep up with my brother who was five years older than me. That's like, <laughs> it was ridiculous, but we grew up in Roxbury and there wasn't a lot of other kids around. We we're very far. So, you know, if, if we wanted to play outside or do something outside, like I just, I had to keep up. Otherwise, you know, I was solo. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, Stratton was such a wonderful environment to be learning to ski. It wasn't far from my parents' house in Connecticut. So it was easy for the whole family to enjoy. And we had two other family friends that would go up with their kids. And so we had this like fun little blended family that we'd see on the weekends during the winter. And we were always just moving in these just like great groups of just wonderful people that had just great energy that were, they were living in the moment because they were working nine to fives during the week. So the time to enjoy the mountain and their family was on the weekends with all of us. Um, so it was just Stratton fostered this incredible environment to have all of us get started in the sport. And then we naturally all transitioned into becoming snowboarders and just being the rebels of the mountain. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, I'm actually really excited to be heading up there today and to go up for a book signing. I just, I haven't had as much time to get back there with the pandemic shutting everything down and, mm. and still be traveling as much as I am and competing. So whenever I get a chance to go back to Stratton, I love it because it's, it's like no time's passed and you see everyone and everyone remembers each other. It's just like this little extended family, which is just wonderful. I can see it in the sparkle in your eyes. Almost as if someone has said, Santa Claus does exist. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Lindsay, I wonder, from being that little girl that tried to keep up with her brother to being the athlete you are today, what has helped you to keep that love for the sport? Because with all the ups and the downs, what has helped you that you still feel the fire rather than it just becoming a profession only? And that's such an interesting feeling because there was a time um, that I was struggling to understand what's my purpose here. I've been racing for you know, over a decade at this point, this was around, you know, maybe 2012 and I actually injured myself. Uh, I tore my ACL at a, uh, practicing for X games. I overshot the last jump and I was then taken out of the sport for almost two seasons for how bad that injury was and having to do all of the rehab to come back. This was before blood flow restriction therapy came and we could build our muscles back. You still have to wait six months for the new ligament. However, you know, if you are doing something from your body or cadaver to revascularize and heal, and then you have to try to make your strength come back. So before all these newer advances in technology to help gain your strength back because you lose muscle mass and atrophy three times faster than you can gain muscle mass, that was always just the killer for me. Um, that actually helped reignite my mm -hmm. love for the sport. 
to be taken away from it. You took, you almost take it for granted in some ways because you're doing it all the time. You're training and it's just part of your daily routine. As soon as it was taken away and I had to fight to get back mentally and physically and then put myself back on the slope and work my way back up to speed on a border cross course was probably the most exhilarating thing I'd had ever really experienced. The questions in your mind, will I be fearless again? Will my knee hold up if I just fall? Will I be Lindsay Jacob Ellis in that sense? Or, you know, some, sometimes people get injured and they just can't get back up to speed. And it's just not, you know, it's a very real reality that they won't be able to be performing in the same capacity as they were, depending on the severity. So to find the love for my sport, to take time off from the competitive circuit and to be free riding with friends and family again, to be finding, you know, pow laps and to find the pure joy of the sport was actually really important for my development and my growth towards getting back to a competitive border cross racer. As a coach, I always find it very interesting how the body in most cases when they have an, in, when we have an injury or any other physical symptom is giving us space to explore our emotions and our mental state. And very often the injuries come when there is something deeper to explore. And it's amazing how you said, you know, like you were questioning your purpose and then suddenly your purpose and your identity also like was kind of taken away for a certain time and stripped away. So it, you were Lindsay and mm -hmm. it, like life gave you two years to figure out who are you, how are you coming back um, to reignite your passion, your love, your fire. So I... Yeah, I always find it so interesting with the body, like how it's such a friend, even if we go through so many struggles in so many times. And at that time, it's sometimes, I think, very hard to accept and also to understand. But I think mm -hmm. when we look back, we always understand, okay, my body gave me the break so I could do X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. I wonder... What were the biggest lessons you learned from those two years where you were out of the game? I would say I'm a believer in everything happens for a reason. You can't mm -hmm. always understand why. And with an injury, you're like, why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? What did I do wrong? Why did I not prepare properly to avoid this, this injury? You know, just sometimes there is no answer in the present moment. But like you said, it, it helped reignite that love for the sport. And maybe that was the break that I needed to make sure I had that same momentum and support to carry me to Beijing in 2022. I mean, we, we you ultimately don't know mm -hmm. if those were these little pieces of the puzzle. That's why it's, it's so hard to create this blueprint when I have kids and parents come up to me and say, what do you do? What should I do? I'm like, well, these are steps that could help you get in the right direction. But ultimately your child is going to, you know, carve their own path in whatever they're doing in life. And it could take them to this road or that road. And ultimately you just, you have to let it flow because you, you don't know and you can't just be focused on this one road because it, it's unlikely that you could stay that course without any deviations. I love how you share with others that you can give them some guidance, but it's not the, like a recipe where you just, you know, like you cook something. And I think it's so important, not just for athletes, but anyone to look out for inspiration and encouragement but at the same time to look within and to allow ourselves to carve our path on our own terms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might take a lot of time to know what those terms are and it's a trial and error, but it really is about saying, you know, like Lindsay is Lindsay. 
I am me, like she's my role model. And, um, but that doesn't mean that I need to walk the path the way she did it. Yeah. And some I see, of those yeah. things are, are, you know, irrelevant mm -hmm. and they don't even fit with that person's lifestyle. So, you know, hoping that my, my book could be this, this guide and this motivation and give hope or, in, you know, just any level of inspiration was always my goal, but it's never just the ultimate path and blueprint to follow. And I think that's very important, especially when talking to teenagers and their parents mm -hmm. to say there is not this yeah. one blueprint, because I think actually even more important to tell the parents <laughs> <laughs> since they're often the overachievers and they're ones that really want it sometimes even more than the kids. And that also develops a lot of self-belief and self-trust mm -hmm. to say, yes. you know, like my success comes from being me and not someone else. Yeah. So I, I really, really love that you encourage people to do that. My, what I would really love to talk about is as you know, like we bring together animal lovers on our podcast and we read that during writing the book, unfortunately your dog passed away. Yes. Could you, could you talk about your dog? Um, I, I think you've been together for 17 years. Yeah. So, so I got Gidget after 2006 Olympics. Obviously I was in a very vulnerable spot. It seemed like the right time to do that. I've always wanted to have a dog of my own, but I was just traveling like crazy. So I just didn't see that happening, but I definitely wanted to revisit that conversation with myself after 2006 and kind of just what had transpired just told me, you know, this was the right time to do it. And my boyfriend at the time, uh, found a breeder. Um, he got a boy and I got Gidget. We did, we were so young at that time. We're like, maybe we should not be getting a dog together. Maybe we just get siblings um, that I way. I love that you know, idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we were all gung ho for a, a, a hot minute saying, you know, we're going to get a dog. And then we're like, wait a minute. Um, hmm, maybe that's, maybe we should rethink this. And I was, I mean, it was great that we did. And Guinness and Gidget were able to stay pretty close with each other throughout their lives. Um, and it was some, it was really hard for me to share the passing of Gidget. And I didn't even post on social media. I just, I couldn't, she had been my emotional support for 17 years and she was starting to really have a hard time, especially in the last six months. So I was very happy that she held out strong for me and didn't have any issues before Olympics. And uh, even happier that my parents were able to take in a senior dog while I was at the Olympics, very well knowing that there could be potential problems if mm. uh, you know, she was starting to slip. But she was active her whole life. She was a part of my training regimens. She was running with me. She was skateboarding with me. I was just very active and always trying to give her the best health and and uh, food and and just exercise so I, I do feel that that really played into her her wonderful long life but i mean it, it was brutal it was the it was probably the worst week of my life to have to say goodbye to her and still haven't really been able to think of you know getting a dog but now i can at least pet dogs and mm -hmm. and that are from people that are passing by and i'm not like breaking into tears anymore so i'm like oh i am open to the fact of mm -hmm. getting another dog <laughs> eventually but yes still 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 a little new and and not fully ready for it um but it was, it felt just so necessary to add Gidget's little mark in my book and doing the paw prints. Um, it was actually even hard for me to do when we were in the editing process and I'd see, I'm like, I got to scroll through. I can't, I can't read mm -hmm. this right now and, and, and see her paws, but I'm very happy that they made it in there and Harper Collins loved it and that it was that it was all part of it. So I feel like I'm honoring her and her space and um, that she'll always be 
written into my history as well. I'm sure she appreciates that, like <laughs> looking from above. I don't know. Do you believe that your dog spirit is around or? I, I definitely do. I mean, spirits, energy, and mm -hmm. I, I know Gidget would always want me to be living life to the fullest and be traveling and still be having that memory of her. Um, so I, I do believe that. And my mom always would say, you know, she's part of the pack now. She's going to ride with you and she's going to protect you because all the dogs that we had lost in, you know, throughout the years, um, I used to, I had a, a really cool Troy Lee helmet and, uh, they had custom painted with, um, a big shepherd that was on his wow. name was Duke. And it was just this beautiful picture, but it was like him kind of like peering over a fence. And it was just this beautiful, just big, just hand painted on my helmet. It was just really cool because I was still young and my mom was just like, you know, he's there protecting you. He's riding, you know, he's the head of the pack and he's going to keep you safe. He's going to keep people away from you and stop them from crashing into you. <laughs> so I love I, that. I, I always I, believe that. <laughs> I, re I, I, I love that so much. And I, so much I love about this story and about your bond. And also, I believe dogs find us. I say this probably on every single episode, <laughs> but I truly, really believe. And her being there, like from your fall till after your rise. I yes. think it just shows like what purpose she had, like she had Absolutely. such a huge purpose in your life and you probably gave her, like she also for sure felt her purpose. And I think it's so beautiful. Like when you, when we think about this connection and big bond, like how much they give us, but also how much we give them when we mm -hmm. allow them to become such a crucial part and pillar in our life. Absolutely. I mean, you think about the, the span of 17 years and getting her when I was 20 years old, you do so much growing up in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And then you start, you know, really figuring out who you are as an individual and all the relationships. So it's just like you go in and out, but she was always the constant. She was always the same. And, you know, I had one of my other girlfriends lose her dog And she was so upset and some other people didn't quite understand. And when I said, you know, this dog has been with you the longest out of any relationship, barring family members, you know, so it is totally normal that you feel this way. And it's, and it is okay that you feel this way. So I'm just like, I, I know how I'll probably feel when Gidget passes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, it wasn't even close. It was, it was <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, they hold so much for us. And we sometimes just don't deserve dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had another, on another episode, I was interviewing a veterinary oncologist and she started one of the first pet loss groups in the U S 30 wow. years ago. And we also talked about pet loss because what I come across a lot less now, but more in the like years before is the acknowledgement. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, Oh, why are you so sad? It was a dog Just or a dog. Yeah. exactly. Or why are you still grieving? And I, I never understood why people would say stuff like that or feel and think stuff. But the big understanding that I came through for my own grief, also both humans and animals is how much we grieve is not defined on four legs, three legs, two legs, or even the span of time. It's mm. the depth of the love. Mm. Because yes. I, I fostered a dog for literally only seven days. I cried so much when he left. And as happy as I was that he was adopted, I, I really felt heartbroken. And then I thought, oh, is this maybe a little dramatic for me? <laughs> But then I thought, you know, the second I saw his eyes, like our souls connected, our hearts connected. And when we're sad and when we grieve, it's a reflection of love. So right. that's why it doesn't matter if 
if it's a neighbor's dog or if it's someone we just met or someone we've known for 25 years or a dog we have had for 17. I think it's, yeah, grief is, is a sign that we got to ex experience one of the greatest gifts, which is love. It's well said. Yeah. Oh. And then yeah. behind me, I have, I have the, the Sochi adoption papers, which, is, which was really fun to bring home that dog from Russia. And he came into my life at, you know, a very unique time as well. I feel like he found me. He like mm -hmm. just honed in on me and he was like that one. And, you know, again, I, I'd come short of getting a medal there. It was, it was an upsetting you know, experience. It was just, it's a lot of intense emotions that are surrounding an Olympic experience and that I was able to take Sochi home was, was a win there itself. And, and then my parents commandeered him because they really liked him. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. he's, he's been living out his days in Connecticut and mm -hmm. has a lot of room to run. And my mom has a dog too. So they're, they're great buddies. Um, yeah. uh, that's, it's just so, so beautiful. Uh, so you've been like what I hear you've been growing up with dogs, right? Always. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think is one of the biggest life lessons? I, I know every dog is very different, but could you, is there one lesson you think every dog taught you? I would say communication on a different level because they can't use words. They can only be um, using their body and certain gestures. And it's something that can be very easily ignored. And you're just like, oh, it's the dog. Like for, the dog has water, if it was fed, he was outside. But when you're able to tune in and have this communication and have this understanding of what your animal is asking for at the time, whether it's just love and affection or he wants you to move the curtain open so more of the sun comes in, he can lay in the sun and be like, you just, you just get to know what your animal wants without even having any words exchanged, which I just think is beautiful. Communication, especially nowadays where a lot of people struggle with the art of communication. It's beautiful mm -hmm. that you are pointing that out and that like, it's being mindful and being present and not having to need always express things and needs with words. Mm -hmm. I wonder being present with dogs, has it also helped you to communicate with yourself better, like with your body and like to tune in with your needs? I think that was just maybe a level of maturity and mm -hmm. and what I was developing as an individual. Um, but having an animal, always having a dog in my life always put me on some sort of routine because I had to make sure, you know, my animal was taken care of first and then I could be taking care of my, myself. So if I wanted to go do something a little fun or be away from the house, I need to make sure that my, my animal my dog was always taken care of and they were taken care of first. So I always came second. So I was always putting their needs before mine. Um, so I think that that also helps make you, makes you aware with your friendships and your families that, that you're not only just acting in a selfless way that you are being aware of what other people are feeling around you and what they might need before you're taking care of just yourself. That's so beautiful. It's, I, that's why I want, it's one of my favorite questions to always ask people. What have you learned from pets? Because it's amazing how the, the lessons, they give them to us in a very subtle way, but they mm -hmm. are so powerful if we take the time mm -hmm. to reflect on them. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, we usually close every episode with a Q and A about the dogs. So okay. I know since your dog passed away, um, I'll ask that questions a little differently and you only okay. answer if it's okay for you. Okay. What is one out of the many reasons you are grateful for your dog? <sighs> Gidget always gave me such comfort 
And I loved that she was always down to cuddle and just, she was either out, out and about, had so much energy outside, but if it was time to just come inside and chill, she would just want to be right next to me. And if you could talk to her, what question would you ask her? Um, what was her favorite thing to do with me? I think her answer would be so long. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we would need another episode for that. <laughs> well, I feel like I would always bring her around and she'd, she'd go along mm -hmm. with it. She'd do it. But, you know, I always just felt that she was maybe doing it sometimes because I was just you know, her owner and she was just going with it. I mean, I know she loved walks and things like that, but sometimes I'd put her on like a stand up paddleboard and she'd be like, she'd be there, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know how, what her stoke level was. And if, if, if she was just doing, it, she's like, oh, I'm outside this, you know, this is fine. Or like, this is the best thing ever. So that would, um, that would definitely be high on my curiosity list to see what was, what was her favorite thing. I, I mean, the way you described your love for dogs and also how they found you and everything you did together. If I was a dog, I would want you to be my mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like this. It, it just sounds so much love paired with adventure and so much depth. And I find that just so, 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 so beautiful. So Lindsay, you already said earlier that you have a lot to do today. So that's why I want to wrap up the episode. Thanking you so much for your time. It's, it's been such a pleasure. I literally out of the 50 minutes we talked, I think I had 45 minutes goosebumps because yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, I'm going to show notes will be just one word goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you so much for being so human, so open and vulnerable and inspirational on so many levels. And I'm sure our listeners will love this conversation and their hearts will blossom and that they will find comfort for also challenging times. So I really, really, really want to thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time and being patient with scheduling with me. <laughs> so I know that was not good. Thing. Good things take time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's a All wrap right. for today everyone thanks for tuning in if you loved our conversation as much as we did please share it with your family and friends and don't forget to tag us and also Lindsay. we'd love to hear your thoughts on it and we'll be back next wednesday <laughs>